then who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their enemy is, excuse me, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship, it's in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. <clears throat> what about you? I like to hike. That's one of the reasons why we moved up here. We're thankful <laughs> for the wonderful opportunities that hiking brings us. And oftentimes when you're hiking, you will come to something like this in the forest. You've probably been there before. And if you're like me, you probably, even if you had a map, lost it by this point in the trail. And you'll come to a point in the trail where there's a choice to be made. Two paths. Sometimes they come back together and sometimes they don't. You just never know for sure. But you know this well, don't you? Two paths and two destinies. In a very real way, I think Paul here is saying there are two paths in this life. There's one that leads to destruction, and there's another one that leads to glory. Choose well. Choose well the path. Robert Frost said it this way, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, I don't mean it in the same sense probably Frost did, but there are two roads, and choosing the right one is an important you know, Paul's not the only one who said that. Jesus said that too, didn't he? He said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Broad is the road that leads where? To destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate. And narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Two completely different paths. You come to a point in the wilderness on the road, the path, and all of a sudden it forks. So what do you do? What was it that Yogi Berra once said? He said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, maybe that's not the best. <laughs> Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there's a narrow, a narrow gate and a narrow path. And guess what? Jesus embodies that narrow way. He shows us the way. He invites us. He says, I am that way that you need to take. And he shows us the way. And really that whole thing that we find in the Gospels about Jesus discipling and passing on this way of the cross, this way of following Christ, of becoming like him, is Jesus being that narrow path. It's showing us how to do it. And here Paul kind of takes that idea that, oh, there's a narrow path and we need to stay on the path. Let's live up to what we've already attained. Let's not take the diversion over here into something else. Let's keep on the right path. Don't be distracted by the things you might see over here. It kind of looks shiny and happy and that, that looks like it might be a good place to go. But in reality, you want to stay on the right path because that's the path that leads to life. It's the path that leads to glory. It's the path that leads to all the blessings of eternity. Paul says, I want you guys to imitate me. Follow me on the path. Let's take the right path, if you will. The narrow path. The Jesus path. In another place, Paul says it this way. Follow my example as I follow the example 
of Christ. You see what's happening here? Jesus set the way for us. He showed us, embodied the very idea of being the way along the path. The right way, the narrow way. And now Paul say, oh, I want you to follow me on the path that Jesus himself took. Follow Jesus, because I'm following, or follow me because I'm following Jesus. He said, there's some other people who are following me too. You can follow them too. They're all models for you of how to live this life that Jesus has for us. This life he has earlier described as the way of the cross and the way of humility, the way of Christ. And one of the things I love about this is, you know, we've been talking a lot about mentoring and modeling behavior and passing it on to the next generation. Well, that's what Paul's doing here. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, follow me. Follow those who are following me. Imitate us. We're setting a model for you. We're trying to show you how to do it. Now, come follow us on the right path. And this is very much in keeping with the whole model of teaching that was used in early Judaism. Um, you know, remember Paul was a Pharisee and he grew up in this model of people mentoring other people and showing them the right path. Well, he changed paths, of course, from the Pharisee path to the way of Christ. But this idea of imitating a teacher was the way they did things in, in the Jewish system. A pupil learned not simply by receiving instruction, by, but by putting it into practice. You follow the example of the teacher. Not only what the teacher says, but, but also what the teacher does. You put it into practice. You imitate the one who's the model, the one who's the teacher. Thus you internalize the principles and live them out in the model that's presented by the teacher. That's what Jesus did. And this is what Paul, then, is passing on to the next generation. And let me tell you something. One of our great, um, our wealth as a congregation is that we have mature believers who have so much to pass on to other people. We have a wealth there that we should take advantage of so that you're passing on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation the things that you've learned about what it means to follow Jesus and how to minister in, for Jesus here in this community. Um, and so many other things. How do you live your life, husband and wife, in a marriage situation? How do you, how do, you do the family thing? Or those of you who are single, how do you do that successfully in this day that we live in? Whatever your situation or circumstance, you have a wealth of wisdom to pass on to somebody else. Paul says, imitate me, follow me, because I'm following Jesus, and if that's going to keep you on the right path. This is a model for mentoring and, and, and modeling the truth. Discipling, equipping, modeling, mentoring. Very much the focus of where we're kind of headed as a congregation in these days to come, which I kind of found encouraging in this text. He, he's brought this up already when he talked about Timothy and Epaphroditus, two who were following him in his example. Two that were commended for the way they were living out the gospel in their lives. Two that were mentored by Paul and were co-workers in his kingdom. So, it's two paths, he says. Now there's one path you don't want to go down, he says. What does it look like? Here's what he says. Many people live as enemies of the, Christ, the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Hmm, know anybody like that? <laughs> Enemies of the cross of Christ. Now that sounds pretty extreme, doesn't it? Their destiny, where is it? Destruction. Their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. Remember, in Romans chapter 1, there's this passage that talks about the Gentiles and, and how they have exchanged the glory of God and they worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. And therefore God gives them over to their sin and they go into an increasing spiral of degradation and sinfulness. They have exchanged glory for shame. And that's what happens. When we choose not to follow the way of Christ, when we choose to follow the other direction, we just follow our own desires and our, our, our life is filled with just living for this earth and for the things of this earth, 
That's the direction that that path takes us. Shame. Destruction. <laughs> Enemies of the cross of Christ. So what are we talking about here? Um, this is the failure to embrace the way of Jesus. And the way of Jesus here was the way of humility, remember? Chapter 2. It's the way of the cross. Chapter 3 and 4. Remember how he says that when we go through suffering, we're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. This is the immediate context he's talking about. The cross is, the, is not always an easy way. It, it means giving up all that you have to follow Jesus with an abandon. To press forward and to press on. Mark talked often about the way of the cross. See, the, the way the whole gospel is, is devoted and the way it's set up. The first half kind of tells us who Jesus is. And the last half shows us the way of the cross. Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. The sacrifices that he makes along the way for our redemption, for our salvation. Failure to embrace Jesus' way, the way of humility, the way of the cross, makes us an enemy of the cross. Of course, the people in the world live this way, right? This is natural. That's what we'd expect. But I think the reason Paul has tears is he sees the potential that they could join them on this road. I don't think that the point here is that he's questioning their salvation, but there are those who profess. They profess they know Christ, but yet they follow down this road just as much as those of the world. I think in essence what Paul is saying is here that this is hedonism. This is someone whose God is their stomach. They live for their appetites. They live for the pleasures of this world. That's what they think life is all about. And there's all kinds of people like this out there. I mean, it happens all the time. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is on the things of this earth. My favorite example of hedonism, I think, is found in the book, and you'd be surprised at this perhaps, but a book you probably have ignored most of your life. It's called Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a book, it's, a, it's wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And in it, there is someone called Kohelet, that's his Hebrew name, which means a teacher or a preacher. And <clears throat> there's some question as to whether it was Solomon himself who wrote the book, or whether it was a teacher, because that's what he says, that I'm the teacher, and renames himself. But it's pretty clear that the example is Solomon, okay? My theory on it is that the teacher is coming to class like Abraham Lincoln. You, know, you ever read a good history teacher that came to class dressed up like the character and pretended that he was that character? I had a philosophy teacher like that. He would come to class trying to teach you some philosophy, whatever the particular one, and on Monday he would give you this philosophy. He'd come as one of those philosophers, and you would argue with him back and forth. So he came and impersonated the person. And then Wednesday he'd come up and he would argue for the complete opposite thing. But he would be in the character of that person who was a philosopher and believed that. And it was like we tried the same arguments that he was giving us on Monday and they never worked. He was good at it. But I think Colette is kind of like that. We can't say for sure. But it's clear that the example that's being described in Ecclesiastes is very much like the example of wise Solomon. Remember Solomon had it all? at least by the world standards. He had everything. And what was his, what was, what was his, yeah, he had a lot of wives, that's true. <laughs> he did. And beyond that, he had harems of others that were part of his rule and reign. He had everything. I think Barney Rubble, you know, the great philosopher Barney Rubble, <laughs> he said it, well, he said this, it takes a smart man to know he's stupid. <laughs> and in my reality, when I'm reading through the book of Ecclesiastes, I think that pretty much sums it up. And, and when you get to it, what, what does he say? He basically says that life is a puff of air. It's meaningless. Life lived under the sun. Life lived for earthly things. Life lived for the pursuit of pleasure. It's just a puff of air. It's meaningless. And I like this one even better. Verse 8 of chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, he says this, All things are wearisome. And my paraphrase of that would be this, I'm bored. Yeah. <laughs> I've got everything. I've got everything you can imagine. All the money, all the power, all the prestige, all the pleasures of this earth. 
the most beautiful gardens and the most beautiful palace. I've got everything. And I'm bored. <laughs> Hedonism takes us there. And we know it well, don't we? We have a society that does hedonism really, really well and glories in it. We make reality stars out of hedonists. We do it all the time. The meaningless pursuit of Solomon, or Kohaleth here. He talks about fame. He says it's meaningless. He talks about education. Even pursuing education got him nowhere in the end. Pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure. You name it, he had it. You can read about it in chapter 2. Materialism, he had it. Meaningless. Power and position, he had it. What was his verdict? It's meaningless. Even his work, which could be a meaningful thing. But he's come to realize that he worked hard, and he's just going to pass it on to somebody who doesn't care about it anyway. Some spoiled brat children are going to take all of his wealth in the end. So he says, it too is meaningless. The meaningless pursuit. He says, I'm bored with it all. And that's where hedonism takes us. That's the, that's the lifestyle we see in our world today. And Paul here is saying, don't go down that road. <coughs> it may look good. It may look flashy. It may look fun. But don't go down that road. That's not where your meaning and purpose is. You are a citizen of heaven. Not of the things of this earth. The glimpse of hope, of course, in Ecclesiastes is this. In chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, he says this. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? But this is my favorite. The man who pleases God, to him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. You see where it's found? It's not the pursuit of pleasure and money and things. Not the earthly. It's pleasing God. He says that's where you find happiness. That's where you find wisdom. That's where you find knowledge. Now, of course, in Ecclesiastes, it's just a glimpse of hope. But that hope is, is built up and found to be, uh, you know, it's amazing how Paul develops that, the that theme of hope. Apparently the snow is making me um, unable to talk. Okay, so this is a path anyway, <laughs> just to kind of move on here. This is a path characterized by an ending in destruction. I always like Romans 3.16. Ruin and misery mark their ways. What a perfect description of the life of pursuing things of this earth. It messes up everybody. Not only your life, but it ruins and brings misery to everybody else around you. When we live on the path of sin, we always, it's amazing how we hurt, how much we destroy, how much pain we cause other people by the pursuit of our own selfish desires. But Paul says it quite clearly here, their destiny is destruction. Their destiny is destruction. Jesus said the same thing. Take the broad way, Destruction. Now it's pretty clear that, you know, when, for the world, what this means is ultimately eternal destruction, right? I remember one time I was teaching on a text kind of like this, and um, I was, um, but it was a little bit more clear, and, and I said something about hell, and I said it pretty strongly. And I'm not usually a hellfire brimstone kind of preacher, but I said, you know, made a pretty strong statement about how. It, what Jesus was talking about here was ultimately talking about destruction, eternal destruction, separation from God in hell. And I remember this, this guy is about four years old, I would say. And he was down there coloring, you know, just kind of paying attention to what's going on. He heard what I said. He looked up. And he had this startled look on his face. And he said, Pastor Jeff just swore. <laughs> <laughs> He said it so everybody could hear it too. It was so funny. It was so funny. But in actuality, that's where it takes you. Eternal destruction and separation from God. And that's not such a good thing. You know, Huck Finn, you remember Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, and, and Huck? He had this idea of heaven and hell that I think is a lie that many of us believe. He said, this is Huck, he said, now she, speaking of Miss Watson, she had a, she got a start, and she went on and told me all about the good place, about heaven. And she said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp, 
and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much about it, but I never said so. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said, not by a considerable sight. And I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that. What a sad lie. This idea that you know, I don't want to go to heaven because all my friends are going to hell. <laughs> what sad thing is that? I mean, that is a total, a total misunderstanding of what's going on. It says two things. You don't understand heaven, and you don't understand hell. Because you would never make that crazy choice. So that's one way. The hedonistic way. The way of pleasure. The way of the world. Looking at life through eyes of what can I do here on this earth? How do I make this life the most pleasant, the most pleasurable, the most fun? If that's my pursuit, and Paul says, I left all that stuff behind me, that was garbage, I left it behind so that I could know Christ. Well, what's the other way? The other way is the Jesus way. There's another path. It's the way of Jesus. In Philippians 2, it's the way of humility. Remember this? He humbled himself and became a man. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's the way of humility expressed in the life of Christ. But then what does it say after that? Therefore, God gave him, God exalted him to the highest place, Gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, through his act of humility, through his life of humility, therefore was exalted to the place of glory, and given a name that's above every name. And he comes to rule and to reign, and ultimately he comes to express himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords is expressed in the book of Revelation, riding in on the white horse. Don't you love it? I mean, that's, that's where Jesus goes with this thing. It's, he takes and de demonstrates his victory and his rulership over all things. Well, that's the way of humility. And, Jesus, and Paul says, that's the way you need to go, in part. But the way of Jesus is not just the way of humility. It's also the way of the cross. Remember what Paul has just said. I want to know Christ. I want to know him in what? In the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. His, I've, I've counted all that other stuff lost. Now all I want to do is press on. I want to know him more. I want to know him better. I want to more, know him more deeply. And part of that is taking the way of the cross. And that means putting aside my selfish desires, my earthly desires, and choosing that I'm going to follow with everything that I've got to do what God wants me to do, to do what Jesus would have me to do. I'm not living for earthly desires anymore. I'm recognizing that I'm a citizen of heaven. I have an eternal destiny, and I'm going to live for that, not for the things of this earth. And I know that when this way of the cross gets difficult, and it will sometimes, that he's with me. He's right there in the middle of it with me. So I press on. So the way of Jesus is the way that Paul is telling us to go. First Peter 2 said this, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now what is he talking about there? He's talking about Jesus was the ultimate example of how we deal with suffering and injustice. His death on the cross. He says, Peter says, we should follow in his steps in this way. Instead of enemies of the Christ cross, see what I told you? Enemies of the cross, we become, we embrace it. We recognize it in the midst of the tough times, in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the trials of life. I can find joy. Why? Because God is working out Christ into my life. I'm becoming more like. I'm getting more perseverance and endurance and patience and so many other characteristics that we so desperately need in our life. Maybe not what we want to hear, but it's a part of what he's trying to tell us. 
The way of knowing Christ and following Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. When that is your pursuit, when you do it with the kind of dedication that Paul suggests, in the terms of being a runner that presses toward the goal, that won't give up, but that perseveres all the way to the end and will not be deterred from the goal, that's the way of knowing and following Christ. But our citizenship, not here in this world, but it's in heaven. Remember the Philippians? They had an interesting relationship. Though they were not in Rome, they had lex italicum, Italian law. They were, in a very special way, citizens of another city. The ruling city, Rome. In the same way, those who were believers in Jesus in Philippi were people who had citizenship in their eternal destiny. In Christ. He says, our citizenship is not the things of this earth, it's in heaven. And we're eagerly awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious body. Paul has a resurrection hope here. He longs for the day when he will have a glorious body like the one that Jesus had after he was raised from the dead. He looks forward to the day Jesus comes back. He's looking for that day where Jesus returns and he brings everything under his control and included in that is the transformation of our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Will you be bored in eternity? Will you be bored in heaven? I don't think so. Science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, kind of like Huck Finn, somebody with such imagination just didn't get it. He said, I don't believe in the afterlife. So I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell. Or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. <laughs> Is it any wonder he was an atheist? He had no imagination when it came to the things of eternity. Because when you look at what the scripture tells us about heaven, what you see is a place of incredible beauty. A place of unending fellowship. I mean, such love and reunion that takes place in heaven. Um, there's so many things. I mean, yes, there will be worship that goes on in heaven. That's a part of what we do. And those of us who are musicians are excited to hear that. I mean, we really going to be a part of that choir where people from every tribe and nation and language are going to gather together around the throne and we're going to worship him. There's no doubt about it. We're going to enjoy that. But that's not all we're going to do in heaven. We're going to serve Christ. And we're going to even rule and reign with Him. Uh, there's all kinds of things that will be a part of that heavenly existence. It won't be boring. It will be meaningful and satisfying. More deeply satisfying than you can even imagine. One of the reasons we don't... I think we don't have the, the love for heaven that we should is we don't have the imagination to believe. You know, everything Scripture gives us is beautiful and wonderful. But I think when John was writing Revelation, he was grasping for words. Because what he was seeing was so incredible <laughs> that even the most beautiful things that he describes there, streets of gold and you know, pearly gates and all that sort of thing, I think he was grasping for words to describe the beauty of what it all will be like. Most importantly, it's where Jesus is, and it's a place he's prepared by him, the one who loves you most. And the psalmist said that in his presence is fullness of joy, and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So get this. If you live this life pursuing pleasure, you'll find destruction. But if you live your life pursuing the pleasure of God, there will be pleasures forevermore. Well, there's so much more that can be said about it. But for many people, like Paul, I think, it's the resurrection that is the big part. It's the culmination of it all. Johnny Erickson Tata has a quote I just love. You know her story, right? She was paralyzed in a diving accident when she was young, a young athletic girl, and 
for the rest of her life, she's just been stuck in a wheelchair. Now, it hasn't kept her back. She's written books. She, she speaks. She has a radio show. She does drawings. She does all kinds of stuff. But she looks forward to the day of resurrection. And listen how she says it. I love this. I still can hardly believe it. I, with shriveled bed fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope this gives someone with spinal cord injury like me? Or someone who is cerebral palsy, brain injured, who, or who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine the hope this gives someone who is manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds. Only in the gospel of Christ do hurting people find such incredible hope. Wow. What does Paul say here? Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What was Jesus' body like after he was raised? <laughs> he says, we're going to have a body like that. <clears throat> so whatever, however poorly we've taken care of this one, or whatever we may have experienced, I can just tell you that you're going to get a new model and the new model is going to be better than anything you could imagine. I think we're still going to be able to recognize you, but you're going to be better than you've ever been. Beautiful thing. Heaven is filled with wonders and blessings, and that's just the start of it. There's so much more to be said about it. But don't, don't buy the lie of Huck Finn. Hell is no place you want to be. You don't want to go down that road. You want eternal life. You want to experience the glories of joy everlasting, pleasures forevermore in the presence of God, a meaningful and purposeful existence where we will become even, uh, we'll be glorified. We'll be experiencing a life that is better than anything we ever had down here. Whatever questions we might have about what heaven will be like, and I've got all kinds of them, the one thing I know is this. It is a place prepared by Jesus, the one who loved me most. And that gives me great, wonderful hope. Two paths. You can't just take both of them. You have to make a choice. Are you going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? Are you going to press forward and press on? Or are you going to kind of veer off? And say, eh, I'm going to try this a little bit. One of the saddest things is when those who are believers in Jesus forget that they're citizens of heaven, and they begin to live like they are citizens of 